In the last section, we identified these major anatomical structures in the brain. So now we're going to get into some animations that hopefully will give you a better feel for how these different structures fit together in three dimensions. And many of the images and animations in this section come from the Digital Anatomist Project at the University of Washington. The first section, videos, will mainly focus on the cortex, the thalamus, the striatum in the basal ganglia, and the hypothalamus. In the following section, the focus will expand to bring in the amygdala, the hippocampus, the rest of the basal ganglia, and the cerebellum. Starting with the cortex, we label some large regions of the cortex by the names of the overlying bones in the skull, the frontal, parietal, occipital and temporal bones that fuse together not long after we're born. These cortical regions are separated by some prominent valleys or sulci that are present in pretty much all individuals. We call these regions lobes and the four major lobes are colored yellow, purple, green, and blue. The label limbic lobe is sometimes given to part of the cortex area you can't see where the two hemispheres face each other. There's a bilateral symmetry evident in most brain structures. In other words, with very few exceptions, there's a left and a right copy of every structure. However, in some cases, certainly including the cortex, there are functional differences between corresponding areas in the left and right hemispheres. The frontal lobe, colored pale blue, is heavily involved in higher cognition. The occipital lobe in yellow at the back does the initial processing of visual information. The temporal lobe in purple at the side does the initial processing of auditory information, but it's also involved in understanding and generating speech, and also in object recognition. The parietal lobe over the top in green integrates information derived from different senses. But as we'll get into later, the, those statements are very much approximations, and cognitive functions don't really correspond with cortical regions. It's just that some regions may be a bit more heavily involved or contribute a bit more to some functions. The other major structure you can see is the cerebellum under the back of the cortical hemispheres and then there's the brain stem at the bottom that leads down to the spinal cord. In humans the cortex is heavily folded and the positions of the folds varies considerably from one individual to the next. Furthermore, even if the folds are in the same position, areas of the cortex with the same information processing role aren't necessarily located in the same positions relative to the folds. So it's not at all easy to make comparisons between the brains of different people. Here's the same starting view of the brain, but this time we'll rotate the brain to see underneath. The cerebellum is more visible, and you can see a part of what's called the limbic lobe in scarlet. The part you can see is the hippocampal gyrus. It's right next to the hippocampus and includes some cortical areas that are closely associated with the hippocampus. You can also see the hypothalamus buried away in there, colored the same as the cerebellum. It's nestled in the center of the base of the brain. The optic nerves, in white, pass from the eyes, under the brain, to the thalamus, which you can't see here because it's hidden behind the hypothalamus. The straight white structures are the olfactory nerves that connect receptors in the nose directly into the cortex. Then the white areas you can see, you can just see them between the cerebellum and the hypothalamus, are the cerebellar peduncles. These are axon bundles that carry information from the cortex to the cerebellum. This is what we call a medial view, with the left half of the brain cut away so that you can see the central section. 
You can see most of the limbic lobe, which includes the cingulate gyrus at the top and the parahippocampal gyrus that we saw earlier. And the parahippocampal gyrus, in this view, is partly hidden behind the brainstem. You can also see the exposed white matter of the cerebellum. The heavy folding of the cerebellar cortex gives the white matter an appearance that has led to it sometimes being called the tree of life. The basal forebrain is a group of nuclei with similar neurons. Part of the group is the septum, or the septal nuclei. The septal nuclei are heavily connected with the hippocampus and vice versa. You can see part of the hippocampus in purple at the bottom. The projection between the hippocampus and the septal nuclei carrying axons is called the fornix, which you can see to some degree also in this picture. But as I'll describe in the next section, the fornix actually follows a very long route going back along the top of the hippocampus where it's actually called the fimbria, then curling up, around and over to reach the septum. The thick white band is called the corpus callosum, and this is the main communication between the two cortical hemispheres. You can also see the white anterior commissure sticking out like a cat's whisker. It's the only structure that's been left in the picture from the left hemisphere. The anterior commissure is an axon bundle that also carries communication between the two cortical hemispheres. But in addition, it carries communication between the left and right hemisphere hippocampus and between the left and right amygdala. As I mentioned earlier, the central sulcus with the precentral gyrus anterior to the sulcus and postcentral gyrus posterior tend to be present in all brains. The postcentral gyrus, in yellow, towards the back of the brain, is where sensory input derived from touch and body position first arrives in the cortex, coming in via the thalamus. And on the other side of the sulcus, most of the blue-coloured precentral gyrus is the primary motor cortex. This area contains large neurons with long axons that extend down to the spinal cord to activate the motor neurons that drive muscles. Two other major features that appear in pretty much every human brain are the lateral fissure and, of course, the longitudinal fissure that separates the two hemispheres. Different areas of both the somatosensory and of the motor cortex map with different parts of the body. There are areas in those cortices corresponding with legs, arms, fingers, and so on. And the left hemisphere cortex maps to the right side of the body and vice versa. And if we rotate the brain, underneath you can once again see the hypothalamus. But in this case, the pituitary gland that's controlled by the hypothalamus is also illustrated. Now the brain has the consistency of a kind of firm jelly, and it's protected by the skull. Within the skull, the brain is actually floating in about 150 milliliters of cerebrospinal fluid, and this fluid is constantly produced. It circulates through four cavities called ventricles, then through the space between the brain and the skull, and leads into the veins. Now, as I mentioned earlier, these ventricles are distinctive landmarks for locating anatomical structures. In this view, the cortical hemispheres have been rendered semi-transparent and just the ventricles are visible. The two lateral ventricles are the structures that are duplicated, one in each hemisphere. The third and fourth ventricles are located centrally and are two of the very few brain structures that aren't duplicated in the left and right. If you remove some of the cortex, you can see the white matter. This white matter contains about 10 billion axons. And out of that number, over 99.5% go only between different cortical neurons. Less than half a percent 
go down to the subcortical structures. So if you like, the cortex largely talks to itself. If you peel back the white matter from the right hemisphere, you can see some of the subcortical structures underneath. For example, in this view, you can see part of the basal ganglia, colored green under the lateral ventricle. This part is called the chordate nucleus. The amygdala is also shown, and the claustrum is a thin, irregular sheet of neurons that appears to play a role in communication between the two brain, brain hemispheres, but I will hardly be discussing it at all in this course. In this view, the cortical hemispheres are again semi-transparent, and the physical locations of thalamus, hypothalamus, and pituitary gland are shown. The thalamus is under the lateral ventricles, closer to the center of the brain than the caudate nucleus that was illustrated in the previous slide. And the primary motor area is shown in blue, and the primary somatosensory area in green. Both the thalamus and the hypothalamus are bilateral. In other words, there's left and right hemisphere versions. But the pituitary isn't bilateral, although it does have very different anterior and posterior regions that have quite different functions. We caught a glimpse of the chordate nucleus in the earlier diagram, tucked under the lateral ventricle. And this gives us a more complete view with almost everything else left out and the cortex again made semi-transparent. The chordate nucleus has three regions usually identified as the head, the body, and the tail. The arrows indicate those three parts in the same left hemisphere. That's the one on our side of the picture. There's also another structure right next to it called the putamen. And again, the arrow indicates the left hemisphere version. The chordate nucleus and putamen are very similar in terms of the neurons they contain and the way their neurons are organized and connected with other structures. The two together are generally called the striatum. The striatum gets lots of inputs from the cortex and the main difference between the two parts is the regions of the cortex that provide the inputs. The thalamus isn't shown, but it's located between the left and the right hemisphere striatum, in there between the two. Here, we're showing the lateral ventricles, with the striatum nestled underneath. And remember that the left and right thalamus are also nestled under those ventricles, in the central space between the left and right striatum. Now, to confuse things a bit, there's another structure that has quite similar structures to the striatum, but a few differences. This part is called the ventral striatum because it's under the main striatum, and in this picture it's colored yellow. If we use the term ventral striatum, we tend to call the main striatum the dorsal striatum. Remember, dorsal means higher up. But the ventral striatum is also often called the nucleus accumbens. When we use that term, we tend to refer to the dorsal striatum that's made up of the chordate nucleus and putamen as just the striatum. The putamen part of the striatum seems to be heavily involved in the selection of motor behaviours, and the chordate nucleus part more in cognitive behaviour selection, and the nucleus accumbens seems to have something to do with rewards for behaviours, and perhaps as a result the nucleus accumbens, or ventral striatum, is often implicated in drug or other addictions. Now let's go to the thalamus for a moment, and as I mentioned, the thalamus has a lot of subnuclei. Sensory information from the eyes 
goes first to one of these subnuclei called the lateral genicular nucleus or LGN. From that nucleus it goes to the primary visual cortex at the back of the brain. The lateral genicular nucleus sticks off the back of the main body of the thalamus and bends underneath. The optic nerve goes into the LGN. The thalamus is under the lateral ventricles and once again if the striatum was illustrated it will be also under the ventricles but lateral to or on the outside of the thalamus. The hypothalamus, coloured yellow here, is below or ventral to the thalamus. The infundibulum carries information from the hypothalamus down to the even more ventral pituitary gland, although the pituitary isn't actually illustrated. The infundibulum has two parts. One is a bundle of axons, the other carries a flow of blood containing hormones, and both come from the hypothalamus. So that introduces the relative positions of the cortex, the thalamus, and the striatum. And in the next section, we'll bring in the other major brain structures.